Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's good to be back. And I don't know if you guys got the memo, but I really dislike crunching out videos. But the good news is that I'll only make videos about stuff that I feel strongly about. Anyhow, in this video, I'm going to be doing something different. Usually on my channel, I debunk the arguments made by ex-Muslims, heretics, Christians, other Christians, and even closet atheists. But today, today things are different. Um, I'm going to be focusing on exposing a Harvard professor. And that Harvard professor is Shadi Hikmat Nasser. Now, you'd think that a Harvard professor would be above some of those that I've dealt with in the past. However, you'd be surprised by the stuff that he's been able to get away with in the past. For some reason, some Muslims are intimidated by Western academics. And due to that, I'm going to be making an example out of Shadi Nasr, who allegedly specializes in Quranic sciences. And I'm going to demonstrate the egregious blunders, the inexcusable errors that he has committed. Things that wouldn't fly in a traditional Islamic setting. But I don't want to take up more of your time. Here's a bunch of lies, distortions, manipulations, uh, misquotations by Harvard professor Shadi Hikmat Nasr. For those of you that aren't aware, Asim bin Abi Najud is one of the main reciters of the Qur'an and his recitation is adhered to by most Muslims today. When we return to Shadi's transmission of Variant Readings, page 21, we find him making the unfounded claim that Asim is unanimously known to be a weak hadith transmitter. He references Ibn Hajar's Tahdib, volume 1, page 627, which has absolutely nothing to do with the claim that he made. He got the volume number wrong, the page number wrong, and the information wrong. But this is a recurrent theme of sloppiness that I'm kind of used to when going through Shadi Nasr's work. When we actually return to his biography in volume 2, page 250 to 251, we find scholars like Al-Ajli, Ibn Ma'in, Imam Ahmed, Abu Zur'a, and al nasai praising him. Al-Bazar said that he isn't aware of anyone that dismissed Asim's hadith. I find it kind of confusing how Shadi Nasr was able to overlook all of this positive information about Asim. Perhaps it has something to do with his bias or his agenda against the Quran. But it doesn't stop at Asim. Shadi actually believes that all the reciters are weak. If you thought the previous example was bad, wait until you see this. Shadi says in transmission of Variant Readings, page 111, he makes the claim that the seven slash ten readers and their two main rawis were all deemed weak, vaif, and careless in their transmission of hadith. The claim that all the reciters are weak in hadith is an audacious lie, which Shadi refutes in his second book, page 134 to 135. On page 131, Shadi awkwardly tiptoes around the subject when providing the biographies of the reciters, stating that he will list the negative information only. The reason I find this very interesting is because Shadi accuses Al-Khu'i, the Shi'i scholar, of trying to systematically undermine the value of the canonical readings. But unlike Shadi, at least Al-Khu'i had the decency to provide the positive information about the reciters. Isn't it ironic that a sectarian Shia Ayatollah is fairer than someone from Western academia, despite trying to systematically undermine the value of the canonical readings? His words, not mine. In Shadi's second canonization, page 132, he states that Qumbul was a corrupt chief of police. Kharubat siratahu. This quote is from volume 7, pages 284 to 285, in the Abu Ghudda edition. But when we actually go back to the source he's quoting, we find the exact opposite, which says, Humidat siratahu, which means that he was praised, not that he became corrupt. So, subhanAllah, a positive statement turned into a negative statement. Shadi, you referenced this page in this book, in this edition. How the heck did that happen? This is a Harvard professor, ladies and gentlemen. Sometimes Shadi is just simply incompetent. 
For example, he provides this little biography about Abdullah bin Dhaqwan, the Rawi of the recitation of Ibn Amr. One problem though, this person that he is referring to is Abu Zinad al-Madani, which he is confusing with Abdullah bin Ahmed bin Bashir bin Dhaqwan, the Dimashqi reciter. There's a century between their deaths, they lived in different regions, and this is just shameful. If you're going to write about the canonical reciters, then the least that you should be able to do is identify them correctly. Another example of Shadi's incompetence comes in the form of this misquotation from Tafsir al-Tabari. Shadi says, Al-Tabari claims that the consensus of the readers of his time is against the variant Maliki. Of course, I'm referring to the word Maliki in Surah Al-Fatiha. Then Shadi comments, Could the consensus have changed so rapidly within few years only between Al-Tabari and Ibn Mujahid? So basically, according to Shadi, Al-Tabari is saying that reciting Maliki Yawm din is impermissible according to the consensus. What does this mean? It means that the vast majority of Muslims are reciting Al-Fatiha incorrectly. But in reality, Al-Tabari is saying something else. He is speaking about reciting Malika Yawm din not Maliki Yawm din Okay, sure, you know, it's just a little mistake by Shadi and everyone makes mistakes, right? No, you can't expect people to take you seriously if you're claiming that there's a mistake in Al-Fatiha and all the Muslims are reciting it incorrectly. It's the first variant in the Qur'an. What I want to know is how you got a PhD even though you kept on messing up like this. Sometimes Shadi will make egregious claims and misattributions to scholars. One example is this misattribution to Ibn Atiyah. He says when speaking of the Qira'at on page 40 of transmission of variant readings, their origin was attributed to the Qur'an readers and the transmitters themselves, i.e. to their own selectivity and ijtihad in reading and deciphering the Uthmanic consonantal outline and not to the Prophet. In the footnote, he continues, Ibn Atiyah openly states that the seven readings originated due to the eponymous reader's interpretation ijtihad, of the defective Uthmanic Rasm. First of all, when we return to the quote, we find nothing about a defective Rasm. Secondly, Ibn Atiyah is clearly saying that this ijtihad wasn't based on an interpretation of the consonantal skeleton, but it is based on what the reciters learned from their teachers. So, according to Ibn Atiyah, the early reciters who learned Surah Al-Nas would recite قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ nas which they learned from their teachers, and then they would look at the undotted Mus'haf and say, yes, this fits in exactly as we learned it. And they would then recite it. If the recitation that they learned didn't fit into the consonantal skeleton, they wouldn't recite it. According to Shadi, Ibn Atiyah was saying that the reciters would look at the manuscript and say, hmm, what does this word look like? Could it be a nas? Or maybe it's a yes, which means despair. Yes, yes, um, uh, it could be either قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ or قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْيَأْسِ I think I'm going to choose al nas since it makes more sense to me. Now this is the impression that we get from Shadi's misquotation. He makes the Qur'an appear like it's some sort of crossword puzzle in order to undermine the Qur'an itself. And finally, before ending this video, I'd like to point to Shadi's double standards when it comes to the utilization of reports. If it's a report that he doesn't like, that he's going to claim that it has late origins, and therefore he dismisses its attribution to the Prophet, peace be upon him. For example, the Hadith of the Seven Modes which is narrated by 10 of the Prophet's companions, peace be upon him. Shadi dismisses it, claiming that it only dates to the end of the first century at best. However, he has no qualms in using fabrications. You, you, have, a, you have a good uh, common sense as well, because I mean, in the, same, in the same narrative, I mean, speaking of that, in this same account, or in, in, a, in an offshoot account, after, you know, they made the first collection, Okay, so Zayd, he went around and then he started asking, you know, other companions, okay, tell me what you memorized. And then he started writing them, them down. At the end, according to one narrative, so Abu Bakr, you know, they put the, the uh, you know, the collection in front of, of him. And then he said, what should we call it? <laughs> wow. Right? 
So what should we call? I mean, see, it's it's uh, again, it doesn't matter whether this account is made up or not. It right. tells you something about even the, the person who fabricated the account or who, who transmitted it. It tells you about how people were thinking back then. Or mm -hmm. So he says, what should we call it? You know, again, see, this is the uh, the distinction between something written and something recited. And then one asked, one answered, he said, why don't we call it, uh, what did, did he say, the Torah? Or I forgot which, you know, which term he gave. It's like, let's call it the Torah or let's call it like, you know, the, the scripture or Angel. And then he said, no, this is what the Jews call their scripture. Right, right. We don't want to call it the same. So, but back to your point about knowing what was happening. Of course, they knew what was happening. You know, Arabia was not just an isolated, you know, uh, place where they had no contact with what's happening around them. And then someone suggested that, okay, so why, why don't we call it Mus'haf Codex? This is what they call it in Ethiopia, the Mus'haf, oh, wow. right? And they said, okay, so that's a good, that's a good, so let's call it a Mus'haf. They didn't even call it Quran. They call it Mus'haf. It's just a codex. And that's from back then, not necessarily, again, the account, whether it's early or whether it's, you know, uh, made up 100, 150 years later. Try 400 years, Shadi. The report was documented by Ibn Ashta, and his book isn't even extant. But more importantly, let's use this report to undermine the Quran, even though it's a fabrication, because consistency apparently isn't something that's taught in Harvard. As long as you get to push your theories against traditional Islam, you'll get backing, and perhaps you'll even receive a position in the faculty like yourself, Shadi. The only problem is that when people like you get exposed, it doesn't just look bad on you, it looks bad on your institution as a whole. I'd like to end this video with this note. I've shown several examples of Shadi's manipulations, distortions, misquotations, misrepresentations. Um, however, for some reason, some Muslims see people like Shadi as authorities. He mixes up Maliki and Malika. He has no idea who Ibn Thakwan is. Um, and he misquotes and mistranslates. I could go on and on. And you know how I was able to catch these simply by going back to the references and fact checking for myself. And I've barely even scratched the surface. Is this the level of Western academia? Shadi actually spent years researching this material. Where was his supervisor, William Graham? Most of these blunders aren't even interpretive issues. If this stuff got past the supervisor, then the next question one would ask is where was the dissertation defense committee in challenging him on these issues? Am I more qualified? to critique these works in Quranic sciences than Shadi's supervisor? Should Harvard hire me to join their faculty to help serve on dissertation defense committees? And sadly, some Muslims fall for the works of people like Shadi. They are blinded by the allure of Western academia and for some reason prefer it over traditional Islamic institutions. They consider traditional Islam to be something of a Sunday school that should be approached with skepticism. But on the other hand, they consume the distorted information produced by charlatans like Shadi. So my recommendation to those people is before tossing 14 centuries of scholarship under the bus, Next time you come across a poorly referenced article or book, extend the skepticism that you preach about to Western academia, instead of just limiting it to traditional Islamic institutions. And that's all I have for you guys today in this video. I'll see you guys in the next one. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.